I am Thomas Solomon, and you are listening to the VO2 Podcast. If you listened to part one, you are now well informed about the risks of winter training and what hypothermia is. To continue with my quest to help you train smart, in part two, I outline what you can do before you step out the door to help manage your risk of succumbing to the dark side of the winter, your energy status and your clothing choices. The phrase risk management sounds bloody boring, but in cold weather it could save your life. That aside, looking through the less morbid glasses of optimism, risk management of the cold may keep you progressing through a race or a training session when those around you are fading into the abyss. So, to help yourself consistently train smart through the winter, your first step is to identify the cold hazards and then take steps to mitigate them. Learning to recognise changes in weather conditions will help alert you to necessary changes in your plans that will reduce cold exposure and reduce the cold risk of injuries. Hypothermia most often develops when you are not prepared for it. If you think things are bad, they will get worse. Unexpected rain or wind or unexpected and or colder than expected water immersion can come as a shock and remove large amounts of body heat. As I explained in part one, body heat loss is much greater in cold, wet and windy conditions and if exercise intensity is not high enough to offset body heat loss. This is when the risk of developing hypothermia is greatest. Therefore, continually re-evaluate as more input information becomes available. As a guide, you can commit to memory a risk management checklist, some of which has been adapted from the American College of Sports Medicine's position stand on the prevention of cold injuries during exercise. How cold is it today? What is the air temperature? What is the expected air temperature where you will go? What is the humidity? What is the wind speed? What will be the level of natural shelter? For a current update on your weather, your best advice is to go to the local Met Office webpage. What conditions might I encounter? Are wind, rain, snow and or water immersion possible? Know how the expected weather will affect the terrain. I was removed from a race course and taken to hospital with hypothermia in 2018 when the mid-race temperature abruptly plummeted from 5 above 0 to 5 below 0 as the beast from the east hit the British Isles. This mercury drop combined with high winds, snow, water immersion and inadequate clothing for the unexpected weather led to a night of cardiac monitoring and warm soup. What other factors might affect my body heat retention? The time of day, your level of fitness, your level of fatigue from prior sessions, your experience, your general health, your body size and your and or body fat level, the planned exercise intensity and duration, your feeding and hydration status, the availability of shelter, standing still, for example if you are at a race and forced to stand around before the start or after you have finished, find something to stand on in addition to your boots and socks. This will insulate your feet from the frozen ground using cardboard, foam or carpet scraps and little tricks that I've picked up from fellow Austrians standing at ski and bobsleigh events. Water immersion, so during an obstacle race, do your utmost to keep your head, neck and shoulders out of the water. If you are able to wade, keep your hands and arms out of the water. A loss of dexterity in your hands will not only prevent you completing rigs and climbing ropes, in an obstacle race, but will also prevent you from opening drinks bottles and food packets, thus limiting your hydration status and fuel supply that can keep you working at a high intensity and generating heat. What can I do to exercise safely in the cold today? Plan your route. If you are in an unfamiliar area, use local resources or web resources to check the routes and conditions. Lots of offline maps are available for download so you can set up your smartphone in low power mode and flight mode to preserve the battery life. My current favourite offline trail resource is the maps.me app. Tell someone where you're headed, how long you will be, who is with you, 
what supplies you have and what your estimated time of arrival will be. Take supplies, but don't overload. Food, fluid, phone, spare clothing, contact numbers, head torch. Obtain accurate weather reports. Use an appropriate feeding and hydration strategy. Use proper clothing and equipment. And plan check clothing changes if required. What can I do when I am out there? Conduct self-checks. Ask yourself, how do I feel? Am I still okay? Conduct buddy checks if you're with others. Evaluate the changing conditions. Be sensible. Know your limits and abort mission when necessary. Yes, adventure is the goal, but know when it is time to stop, seek shelter and turn back. My wife and I recently aborted a summit attempt on Mount Taranaki in New Zealand. When we emerged onto an exposed ridgeline where fog had set in, the rain was lashing down and the wind speed was knocking off, our, knocking us off our feet. Equipped with wood, waterproof gear and good sense, we indeed turned back and all that was needed was a little hot chocolate to warm us back up. These five simple questions will help identify the risks, sorry, identify the hazards and assess the risks and thereby help keep the dark side at bay. So, plan ahead and help yourself train safe. Optimise the factors that you can control. Exposure to cold air temperatures, wind and precipitation is a fact of life during winter training. But your cold weather training does not have to be thwarted by the elements or moved indoors. The key to winter training is to stay safe and remain warm and dry. Maintaining whole body or limb specific thermal balance to maintain exercise performance in cold conditions is tricky. But with the power of knowledge, you will be able to maintain normal core temperature and maintain adequate circulation in your skin and extremities and thereby prevent hypothermia. And prevention is always better than treatment. No matter how many times weather forecasters will try to convince us Looking into the future is not an accurate endeavour, and the weather is out of our control. In part one of this series, I alluded to some of the controllable factors that you can exploit to help mitigate your risk of hypothermia. These include your energy status and your clothing choices. You are in control of your energy status. As described in part one, food restriction, such as, such as an overnight fast, followed by high intensity and or long duration exercise can cause your blood glucose levels to fall below normal levels, aka hypoglycemia. This directly impairs your ability to shiver. Similarly, when your muscle glycogen levels, which are your cellular stores of glucose, are low, this also impairs your ability to maintain heat production during exercise in the cold and delays the onset of shivering. Therefore, both low blood glucose levels and low muscle glycogen levels remove your defence against heat loss, increasing the risk of hypothermia. Before stepping out of the door for any exercise in cold conditions, always ensure that you are adequately fed and, if you plan on being out there for a prolonged period of time, plan your nutrition and your hydration needs. As a footnote, there is a forthcoming series of uh, podcasts on nutrition and hydration that will delve into these topics in more detail. If you can maintain normal core body temperature, cold exposure during exercise does not directly increase oxygen consumption above normal, even in windy conditions. However, it is important to remember that you are still likely to expend slightly more energy during exercise in the cold. This is because your effort level through snow or mud is greater and because you may be carrying more load like heavier clothing and backpacks for spare food and clothing. You will also expend more energy if you start shivering but the intention of this series is for you never to get to that point. Maintaining blood glucose levels within the normal range while maximising muscle glycogen stores will help, help prevent hypothermia. These physiological goals will also prolong the duration at which you can maintain high-intensity exercise under all conditions. 
Therefore, it is sensible to include carbohydrates in your diet if you are an athlete seeking to maximize your performance outcome. If you are able to maintain your core and or muscle temperature, fatigue is most often related to carbohydrate availability rather than thermoregulatory limitations, and exercise can be sustained by ingesting carbohydrate in cold conditions. Because maintaining carbohydrate availability is key, it has been shown that maximizing muscle glycogen with carbohydrate loading before exercise in the cold is beneficial. So, what can you do to help optimize your energy status? At breakfast, to replenish your liver glycogen store, which is depleted overnight, and to top up your muscle glycogen stores, and also to provide some warmth from the thermic effect of metabolizing food, eat carbohydrate containing foods. To prevent a drop in blood glucose levels during a long duration and or high intensity activity, take carbohydrate containing foods with you, foods that suit your tastes and the practicalities of the session or the race. These will provide you with a glucose source to fuel your activity and to spare muscle glycogen while also providing a thermic effect to help keep you warm. You might choose energy products like bars, gels and drinks, but you may also opt for carbohydrate-rich foods like crackers, cereals or bread. Exercise in the cold initially increases core temperature and causes sweating. Sweat rate is increased if exercise is at a high intensity and or while carrying load. If sweat rates during exercise exceed fluid intake, body water loss will occur and the risk of dehydration increases. Dehydration severely impairs exercise performance in temperate and hot environments. On the contrary, dehydration does not impair the onset of shivering or increase your risk of hypothermia directly. So, moderate fluid loss is less of a concern in the winter and dehydration has been shown to have less of an effect on exercise performance in the cold when compared to hot environments. However, poor clothing choices can lead to overheating and high sweat rates, in which case hydration becomes paramount. What can you do to help optimize your hydration status? Plan to bring fluid with you during long sessions. I have learned not to rely on en route water taps in the winter as they are often turned off. But generally, learning to monitor your hydration is wise so as to optimise performance year-round. How to monitor your hydration status will be covered in detail in a future podcast, but you can get started by forming a habit of noting the colour, frequency and volume of your urine on a daily basis. Large, frequent volumes of clear urine indicates that you are adequately hydrated. Infrequent, low volumes of dark urine indicates that you probably need to drink a little more fluid. You are in control of your clothing choices. There is no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. This is a somewhat reductionist mantra, but it gets the point across. Clothing does not produce heat. It retains heat produced by your body. It provides insulation directly and indirectly by trapping air within and between layers, thereby reducing the risk of hypothermia and cold injuries to your skin. But your clothing requirements during exercise will change based on the ambient temperature and exercise intensity. As your intensity increases, the amount of clothing needed to maintain your body temperature will decrease at any given air temperature. Also, always remember that your risk of hypothermia increases if it is wet out there and your exercise intensity is low so staying dry is extremely important. However, it is not possible to state exactly what you should wear, even if you are in the same conditions. Your fitness, your exercise intensity, your sweat rate, your body size, and your energy status will each affect your ability to produce heat. So, continually practice and perfect your clothing choices, learn and adapt to your own needs, with the goal of staying warm and dry and minimizing sweat buildup. What can you do to help optimize your clothing choices? Avoid cotton. Cotton is rubbish. 
When it is wet, cotton retains water, gets heavy, is abrasive and cools you down fast. I spent my teenage years training in Pearl Jam t-shirts and retro style event t-shirts. My teenage grunge image was haunted by many a bloody nipple and numerous shivering bollock freezing moments. Ditch the old school t-shirts, but keep listening to Pearl Jam. Love wool. Wool is ace. It wicks moisture, is insulative, and when wet, stays insulative. Use woolen woolen base layers and mid layers on your extremities, your torso, your head, and your baby making bits. Yes, merino wool products can be expensive, but I have never regretted, regretted wearing them, and there are high quality, low cost options out there. For example, from the Mountain Warehouse own brand products, which I have used successfully for many years. Invest in Gore-Tex. Windproof, waterproof and breathable, Gore-Tex and similar compounds like Pertex have combined these important facets into a single material and are essential are an essential addition to your clothing arsenal. Such fabrics are expensive, but I have learned from much trial and error that they are worth the investment. Some things, some things are just not worth scrimping on. Layer your clothing. The aim is to be warm, but not excessively sweaty, which will promote heat loss. Layering provides a flexible way to adjust your clothing on the fly to prevent overheating and sweating so as to remain dry. Also aim to avoid bulkiness, which can slow you down and or cause pressure points that reduce circulation. Typical cold weather clothing consists of three layers. The base. A lightweight layer in direct contact with your skin that does not absorb moisture but wicks it to the outer layers in order for it to evaporate. Your base layer of cold weather clothing needs to wick perspiration. Microfiber, polyester or polypropylene or woolen products that aren't scratchy all work pretty well. The middle layer. Your primary insulative layer which holds the heat you are generating. A polyester fleece or a woolen product can work very well, as can down if the temperature is super low and you are moving super slow. The thickness of the middle layer needs to be adjusted depending on the conditions and your work rate. The outer layer. Your protective layer stops wind and rain coming in while allowing moisture to transfer from your body to the air without adding unnecessary bulk. The outer layer is a tricky one to master because your sweat rate can easily exceed the vapour transfer rate of the outer material, causing moisture to accumulate on the inside. An outer with vented armpit zips can therefore be very useful. And remember that the outer layer need not be worn during exercise unless it is raining or very windy. Invest in your hand shoes. I couldn't resist dropping one of my favourite German words, Handschuh. Gloves are essential and will maintain warmth and dexterity. Using a layering system similar to your normal clothing is very sensible. I have had a lot of success training in the winter with a thin merino glove liner, the base, under a heavier woolen glove, the middle layer, under a Gore-Tex mitten, the outer layer. The layering is very easy to change on the fly, but like all clothing approaches, do not wait until your hands are cold to put gloves on. Also, as a word of warning, do not blow warm breath into your hand shoes because the vapour in your breath will add moisture to the glove which will contribute to further cooling, especially if that vapour freezes. If you stop for a break, add a layer. When you stop moving, your body temperature will drop more rapidly in cold conditions, so if you stop for food or water or just for some banter, put on a layer. Don't wear too much right away. When you step out that door, if you start with too many layers, you will overheat and sweat. You'll stop to take off a layer, but because you are wet underneath, then you'll cool down rapidly and get cold. The solution? Leave the house wearing fewer layers and take a pack with extra clothes. To look like a pro, many big name brands make packs of varying sizes that are very useful for carrying gear, but they can be very expensive. More pocket-friendly options can be found at Decathlon, which stocks affordable and good quality trail running backpacks 
made by a brand called Kalenji. And they also have trail running tights, which have, which have several zippered pockets for carrying gear. Protect the muscles that you will need. At rest, muscle provides insulation during cold water immersion. But during exercise, blood flow increases and the muscle's insulative property is lost. Using clothing to cover and insulate active muscle is, therefore, very sensible if your race is in cold conditions and would include water immersion. Protect your lungs. If the air is very cold and dry, exercise can increase the risk of cold-induced bronchoconstriction, even if you are healthy. One little trick is to help, to help prevent and remedy this is to wrap a scarf or a buff loosely over your mouth and nose, not so tight that it impedes your breathing, but just enough to humidify your breath. Consider neoprene. In races that require frequent and or prolonged water immersion, using neoprene clothing or even a full neoprene wetsuit is sensible and popular and within the rules of most OCR events. As a side note here, people involved in OCR will know that as of 2020, there is no current universal rulebook that governs all races, so do check the rules of your specific event. If the water immersion section requires swimming, neoprene increases core temperature, reduces drag, increases buoyancy and lowers oxygen consumption at a given speed. This is advantageous and in obstacle racing is not yet deemed an unfair performance enhancement. Even without a full wetsuit, neoprene clothing like gloves, rash vests, arm sleeves and head caps are also useful for maintaining limb-specific thermal balance and limiting heat loss. Protecting the head is particularly important since heat loss from your noggin can be as high as 50% of your total heat production when sitting in very cold conditions. A neoprene cap is easy to take on and off and wearing a woolen liner under a neoprene cap has consistently proven to be a very useful way to combat mid-race cold water immersion. You are in control of your footwear choices. Footwear forms an important part of your clothing choices because your feet also need to stay warm and dry. Admittedly, that is sometimes very difficult, especially if there are water immersion components of your race. This is particularly pertinent to cross-country races, trail races and obstacle races. What can you do to help optimise your footwear choices? Prior prior prioritise time in finding great socks. Cotton is a no-go. It holds moisture, becomes heavy and is abrasive when wet. Merino wool socks are a great choice for warmth and fast drying properties but, as always, it is a matter of personal choice and comfort is a priority. So, try several different types in wet and cold conditions and stick to what works for you. But take note, don't double up on socks or wear socks that are too tight, as this may restrict adequate blood flow to the muscles in your legs. And remember that thicker socks will require a slightly larger shoe to accommodate them. Also remember that your feet will still sweat in the cold, particularly in heavy boots or shoes. A build-up of moisture around your feet for prolonged periods of time will increase the risk of trench foot. So if you plan to be out there working hard for several hours in cold and or wet conditions, always bring one or two changes of socks. Prioritise time in finding grippy, stable and quick draining shoes. As for shoes, again you can pick all sorts of brands and models. Some are even made with Gore-Tex in the uppers, but it is a, again a matter of personal choice. Two important lines of thought when choosing a winter shoe are water drainage, i.e. shoes need to empty water quickly once dunked and not be sponge-like, and grip. Personally, I have never found Gore-Tex in running shoes to be particularly useful. It adds extra weight and only protects you from incoming moisture that does not rise above the ankle, which in winter is almost never. Slipping, however, is a big issue because not only will it lose you time and places in a race, but it can also cause serious injury and even be fatal in the mountains. There is no single shoe that will tackle every type of terrain. 
But there are some shoe companies like Innovate, VJ Sports, Salming and Icebug who have invested large amounts of time into the soles of their shoes and use a variety of rubbers to help with wet rock and even ice studs to help in snowy and icy conditions. Again, personal comfort trumps any recommendation, so try some out. Many trail running stores have tryout days where brands host days where you can borrow a pair of shoes for the entire day and go and destroy them on the trails at no cost or hidden agenda to have to purchase them. This is a great way to decide which shoe might work for you. If you live in particularly icy conditions, I have had great success when living in Denmark, the US, Austria and the UK using yak tracks attached to the outside of my shoes. In very snowy conditions, as I experience here in Austria and also when I lived in the Midwest of Ohio, using snowshoes during most of my winter running was put to great effect. Whatever you choose to put on your feet, side with comfort and don't lace too tightly. In a race, your metatarsal companions will be strapped to your feet for many hours, so learn to form a friendly symbiotic relationship with them. What to do if you do take a turn to the dark side of winter. In 2019, I spent six weeks hiking, climbing and running in the mountains of New Zealand. One of the many things that impressed me about that great country was how on top of outdoor safety the government was. It was not uncommon to be greeted at a trailhead by a park ranger warning you of the current and the predicted conditions, as well as signs along the routes reminding you to conduct self-checks and how to respond to certain dangers. There are also incredible resources and online courses easily and freely available to help learn a little more about staying safe outdoors. One of my poignant memories from those six weeks was the Mountain Safety Council's description of the signs of hypothermia, also known as the umbles. The grumbles, complaining or being argumentative, the fumbles, deteriorating hand-eye coordination, the mumbles, muttering and unclear speech, the stumbles, frequent tripping without reason, and the tumbles, falling without obvious cause. If the umbles are in full swing, do not ignore the signs. You are succumbing to hypothermia. Telling yourself to man up is not useful because it will not warm you up. The best way to help yourself is to get away from the cold conditions and find shelter, ideally in a warm and dry environment, ASAP, and begin warming up your body. At an air temperature of 5 degrees Celsius, heat loss in wet clothes is double that in dry conditions. So if you are wet, follow Nelly's advice and take off all your clothes. Then bundle yourself in dry clothing and blankets to start warming yourself up. Shivering can be quite dramatic, but it helps maintain core temperature and is safe. Just be prepared for it to take a long time to subside, even up to an hour. If someone you are with is experiencing hypothermia, take charge of the situation. Keep them interactive and explain what you want them to do. Find out if they have any medical conditions and prevent any loss of consciousness. In the worst case scenario, if someone does have does become unconscious, stay calm, place them in the recovery position, check for signs, their airway, their breathing and their circulation, the ABC, call for emergency help, keep them warm and, if necessary, administer CPR. So, go and enjoy the winter. Exercising in the cold does not increase musculoskeletal injury risk if you train safe. And being in the cold does not necessarily mean that you will be cold. A cold environment does not need to be a barrier against effective exercise training or even against physically active habits of daily living. Understanding the cold will help you make good decisions and making good decisions is the essence of reaching your genetic potential. So, know the weather conditions, understand what you can do to mitigate the risks, know whether you or others are at greater risk, have a plan in place for dealing with a sudden change in conditions, and ensure you have immediate access to re-warming facilities when you finish your session. And if your races might occur during cold conditions, 
Training in cold conditions will help you learn which approaches work for you. Practice your craft by aiming to get outdoors for as many of your sessions as possible. Stay tuned for the final part of this series in which I will delve into what you can do to condition yourself to being resilient to the cold. In the meantime, keep active, stay warm and keep training smart. As a footnote to this article, I have mentioned a few brands and products throughout this series. I am not sponsored by or receiving advertisement royalties from any brands. Any recommendations I make are and always will be based on my own views and my own opinions.